What's going on, YouTube? Rukar here, back with another episode of the Minotaur Hotel, and apparently we are trying to explain world history to Asteria on the Minotaur. Okay, so, Soviets, for starters, the Allies won World War II, but near the very end of the war, America unveiled a new type of bomb, one that was more powerful than any ever before. After the war, Russia managed to make one of their own. The catch here is that America was capitalist and the Soviet Union were communists. They started the Cold War, which wasn't a war in the strictest sense of the word. They were vying for influence among other countries while threatening each other with the bombs. They both had so many that they could destroy each other at the same time. It's what people called mutually assured destruction, and it actually led to a very interesting series of games called the Fallout franchise, where you played in the alternate timeline where that actually happened. Then it relates to Berlin, because after World War II, the Soviets and Americans divided it in two, with a wall between East and West. Ah, that's why we're talking about East and West Berlin. It divided families and communities for years, but it fell in the 90s along with the Soviet Union. That was a big moment for world history. That all sounds so... overwhelming. And these bombs, were they the kind that were thrown off airplanes? At first, yes, but later they were put in missiles. That's... how can I put it? A kind of unmanned plane that will explode when it hits its target. It was a very, very tense time for everyone. But we left it behind, for the most part. Yes, yes. The voices from the lounge subside as the two of you climb up the spiral staircase side by side. The air here is chilly now. A breeze from the valley passes through that narrow rocky exit far below to flow upward. It snakes through the gap in the middle of the stairs until it grazes your skin and Asterian's fur. It is not unpleasant, however. The shiver it sends up your spine makes you aware of your whole body, aware of each swaying, drunken step. Asterion sways with a similarly inebriated gait, left and right with each hoof step, echoing all the way down to the valley. Without noticing it, Asterion starts humming, and your footsteps align with its rhythm. At times, you even feel his tail grazing your leg. What an odd pair the two of you make. Thousands of times have the masters and their servant walked up and down these stairs, but never did they do so side by side while swaying to the same song. Generation after generation, the Minotaur has done his best to stick to the shadows. The less he was noticed, the smaller the chance the Lord's ire would turn against him. But looking from afar, when one can't quite identify the features and clothing, what distinguishes a Lord from his subject? Perhaps only a pair of horns and hooves, although humanity is quite pliable, isn't it? Is it not? Yeah, just look at a furry convention. How hard is it to overlook another's differences? Humans are familiar with change, quite different indeed from the gods who are said to have created them. And this servant, this prisoner, tonight a smidgen of humanity fidgets within him. Disquiet and want sizzle just underneath the surface. When Asterion speaks, his voice carries a new gravity to it. Master, did you mean it when you said I was a business partner to you? In your drunkenness, you answer without a second thought. Yep, you and I are in this together. I forgot I was supposed to be drunk. Was it just my impression, or did the idea please you? Oh, you have quite the honey tongue, that is all. How could I not smile at your words? Still, you have the silliest ideas, my lord. It is not possible that I could ever be your equal. Even if the hotel won't allow it, I will treat you as such. That's what matters. Ah, uh, the thought suffices, my lord. It is enough for me to know that you care. It's just the right thing. I am not trying to be heroic here. I'm just treating you with the respect a human deserves. And about that, I'm sorry for putting you in a tight spot tonight. I should have known it could have become uncomfortable. But... I wanted it. Miss Greta was a handful, but I enjoyed spending the night with others, my lord. Eating at the table with company now, that's something I missed. Oh, so you may grace THEM with your presence, but you won't have a meal at the same table as I do? Asterion pauses and looks at you with a glimmer in his eye. Is that truly something you desire? You have asked it of me a few times. Eating alongside the guests and staff was my routine, but the Lord stands above all. To share the same table with the Master, that is most unorthodox. If it's something I truly want, would you do it? 
I shall obey all your orders, my lord. Not as a command, I mean. Would you, by your own will, choose to share your meals with me at the same table? You gotta want to do it, or I can't be okay with it. Uh, how can I put it? I'd be ashamed of it. Shy. It may sound like such a small thing to you, but to me it's quite ingrained. Would you laugh at me if I somehow act silly? Well, I'll try not to. No guarantee, though. What I can promise is that if I do laugh, it will be with you and not at you. Asterion stifles a burst of laughter and attempts to feign a measure of indignation. Still, his ears and tail flick playfully. You, you scoundrel. Asterion laughs and continues climbing the stairs. Very well. I can... I mean, I will share a meal with you if the invitation is extended. Breakfast? Yes. Breakfast. I want some breakfast. The times really have changed, and humans along with them. That is fair that you can change too. You are at least part human after all. To call your words honeyed is an understatement, you silver-tongued man. What, are you now turning against your master? What is wrong with a joke, hmm? That's the spirit. Nothing wrong with a little playing around. Guys, I think we're gonna be a thing. It's so cute. Oh, and we go to meet the ferryman. Is he a furry? <laughs> oh no, this is back in his past. I'm an idiot. I'm sorry. It's been a minute. Just ignore me. <laughs> it was like the end of a summer's day rain back at the palace of Gnosis. Rivlets falling to the patio's stone floor, droplets pouring from the trees down to the saffron bushes. The pitter-patter of fat droplets and children's feet as the minotaur sat by the tall red pillars, thinking, not making a noise. Thinking as his father told him to, as he did now. He had walked a dozen steps downhill before he lost his balance and fell to his knees. Now he sat, collecting himself. The minotaur looked up to the stony ceiling hundreds of feet above him, raining down the same fat drops of water on his muzzle. His neck hurt as if a searing iron wire had burned it. His tongue and throat were locked frozen by a lump on his neck. Asterion thought, and thought well as he plucked and then cradled an asphodel flower in his hands. He was surrounded by them in this meadow overlooking a labyrinthine land of rivers. His body ached. But how soft a flower's petals are against one's hand. Its white and pink were like a slash of life in this darkened land. How long did he stay there in the asphodel field? He lost track of time, but he remembers the moment he rose, when he caught himself humming. A nameless, graceless tune coming from deep within him. A cold drop fell on the palm of his hand, and the minotaur was aw awoken from his trance. Prince Asterion, adopted son of King Minos of Crete, rose and looked down towards the rivers, and there he was, the man waiting by the shore. This time he stomped downhill, letting the slope guide him in leaps and bounds. He could not laugh, the lump in his throat made sure of that, but splayed on his muzzle was a smile. When the slope ended, he let momentum carry him to the shore, to the skeletal man in his humble boat. Never before had Asterion seen such a sordid creature. His beard, drier than hay and caked with foul filth, went down to the muddy shore. His feet, half sunk in the mud, had overgrown yellowed nails that were more like fangs than what any human should have. A coarse cloak covered the upper half of his face, but as he shifted on his feet, Asterion caught a glimpse of the old man's eyes. They burned. The man was hollow, like a furnace, and reeked of bitter smoke. Foul was the god on the river's shore, and common was it for nobles and highborn to shy away from him. Judging by Asterion's smile, however, one would guess he beheld a holy envoy covered in fine garments and fragrant with the scent of, scent of flowers. Asterion's hooves sunk into the muddy soil of the river as the old god's gaze crawled over the hybrid. Sensing movement, half a dozen crabs which had hidden in the mud skittered away from the two of them. What a peculiar sight. 
Not a man, and not a beast, much less an immortal. Neither a mournful youth, nor a pacified elder. A smiling newly dead. One leaping down a hill like a nymph. Now let me collect my payment. With his left hand, the foul-smelling elder supported the minotaur's neck and massaged the lump within it with a bony thumb. With his other hand, he reached into Asterion's mouth and plucked the obstruction from his throat like a child would pluck a flower. It was a gold coin so freshly minted it shone like an ember. You must have had a good friend, young hybrid. This will do well. Now tell me, what is your lineage, hybrid son? Words flowed from his lips like honey. The minotaur's heart pranced like a newborn foal, and his face regained some of its color. I am the son of earth and foamy sea, but my race is starry, heavenly. My name is Asterion. Lord Charon, may I cross the river to my place of rest. The old man ran a slender finger over his matted beard as he looked the newly dead up and down. Very well. Come, we shall cross the rivers. It shall be a scenic ride for you, for such a bountiful payment. Ah, oh, what a day, a newly dead beaming with life, heavenly blood in the corpse of a beast, a cursed being with gold to spare. Tell me, boy, why the joy? Is it fair that the bud, plucked before spring, curse the hand which left it to wither? It is fair that the bud, plucked before the spring, cursed the hand which left it to wither. I didn't read that right, I'm sorry. Yet I see no vinegar, only honey and wine. Asterion sat on the boat, his back to the man. He looked ahead to the distant shore. The fire in his chest kept him warm. He did not bother responding to the old god's question. I mean, when you lived a life like Asterion lived, sometimes you just want peace. Alrighty, breakfast time, come on. There are rules to placing cutlery. Forks to the left, knives to the right. With the first set placed on the outside, spoons are placed to the right of the knives. The basics are simple, but it's easy to get wrong if you forget what kind of fork is meant for which meal. I usually just go smallest to largest. In the end, however, it doesn't matter. Very few sit at a dinner table for its sparkling cutlery first and food second, after all. But today, even if for just a moment, the silverware seems like a matter of colossal importance. Asterion ignores the cheese and crackers, cured meats and boiled eggs, jams and pastries. His eyes are locked on your spoon, the disgraceful thing he placed on the wrong side of the plate. Fat drops of sweat run from his forehead to chin, then drip down onto his lap. You can hear a rumble coming from him, a drawn-out grunt of distress followed by the minotaur hunching over you. He woke up different today, stumbling about and skittish, already second-guessing the choice to have breakfast with you. But he wouldn't back down on his word. Now his distress is carved onto his face. You let go of your buttered bread and smile at him. It wouldn't do any good to make him any more nervous with probing for answers. You will need to be delicate. Something the matter, Asterion? You look sick. The Minotaur's eyes shift down to his plate. He recoils further into a compacted ball of fur, his hands clasped above his legs. Asterion's unease crawls over you and gnaws away at your confidence over this situation. Such a simple thing, a breakfast. Just last night he had a contagious eh, sorry. He had a contagious smile when he accused you of harboring a honeyed tongue. Perhaps it was the wine. The idea must have pleased him then, but in sobriety all of a man's shame returns with a vengeance. You look for something to say. Is there even any combination of words that can pull the two of you from this bog? Just how far can words go against tragedy in a man's life? Asterion remains with his hands locked in his lap, gaze down as if in deference. There is no great wisdom that can pull him out, but perhaps honesty can offer some relief. You shouldn't feel bad. His gaze returns to your cutlery, to the disgraceful spoon, then back to himself. I'm not talking about the spoon. You don't deserve to go through this kind of distress at all. We had fun last night, didn't we? Nothing's changed since then. 
You had an enjoyable dinner with the other guests. You and I were at the same table. The one difference is this time the both of us are eating together. He looks off to the side and grinds his teeth. I feel very inadequate. This experience is very unsettling to me. Why? As I said last night, I never had a proper meal with the master. And the spoon, I put it in the wrong place. About the spoon. What can we do to solve it? It's too late. It's in the wrong place already. But can it be fixed? I suppose so. You pick up the spoon and put it in its correct place, to the right of the knives. There. Fixed. One less reason for you to be nervous. Is there anything else bothering you? You can tell me. He lets out a drawn-out sigh. It sounds defeated at first, but his shoulders are relaxed and his eyes are half-closed. Ugh. I sometimes forget. Master is not one who would go for physical punishment. I shall outgrow that fear, worry not. Besides feeling inadequate, I realize now that I don't want you to see me struggling with the cutlery, and I can't shake the feeling you'll be angry with me. Angry because you struggle with a knife and fork? And then what would happen? I don't know. Maybe the master would think less of me, seeing me for what I am. I don't think any less of you. You take a bite. Why do you struggle with cutlery? Did no one ever teach you? I just never needed to learn as to as I grew up, or for a long time after, as a matter of fact. It wasn't until a few centuries ago that I even saw forks. It was a novelty then. People have tried teaching me, but I struggle with fine movements. I prefer eating with my hands. Well, and do just that. There's no issue with it. I like eating with my hands, it's fun. But it would be undignified of me to expose myself this way, and... The times really have changed, haven't they? Is all this distress for nothing? Yep. It's hard for me to understand why you are so nervous. Nothing of what you've done today, even since I arrived at the hotel, deserves any bad reaction. But if you want to use cutlery, then try it. There's no problem if you get it wrong or make a mess. We're in a magic hotel! Do what you want! The Minotaur takes the precious silverware in his hands. And there's no way this is going to end well. You hadn't stopped to watch before, but Asterion's clumsiness with small objects is nothing short of a crime. One can't help but feel the urge to leap out and guide his hand, but this is a challenge he must overcome his himself. The silverware is so thin, he has a hard time keeping it between his thick fingers. It keeps slipping around his hand as well. Overall, Asterion's tr troubled relationship with silverware follows a three-act structure. First, he reacquaints his fingers with the thin metal. His hands quiver like long-lost lovers, touching lips together for the first time in ages. There is an attempt at gracefulness, like teenagers fumbling around in a moment of passion. For a glorious split second, he holds it properly, then the fork slips as he puts pressure on a piece of cheese. In the second act, things take a turn for the worse. As the Minotaur again becomes distressed, he forgets how cutlery is meant to be held. He grips it like two pens, or perhaps a pair of... Or perhaps like a pair of scalpel and pincers. It goes well for half a minute before the fork slips and falls into his glass of orange juice. The fork pleads for help for the hand of his precious lover, but Asterion's mind has turned cold along with the river of sweat running down his back and matting his shirt. The tragedy arrives in the play's third act. Our once plucky hero is consumed by grief, rap, wrath, and hubris. The gods have given up on him, much like he did on love. As if you don't exist, as if dignity was an alien concept, Asterion holds the knife and fork, sticky with juice like a child, gripping the handle as if he was ready to stab- Ah! Stab the mis- cur Miserable cur displayed upon his plate. <laughs> and there he goes. The battle for breakfast is over, and he's about to enjoy his single slice of cheese. It costs his dignity, but that is a small price to pay for sustenance. But the humiliation never ends, for the cheese was sliced too thin. It tears and drops into his laugh, staining his clothes further. <laughs> with a greasy plap as it falls to the floor, the tragedy draws to a close. How much abuse can a man take before snapping? How unfair can the world be? In other periods of human history, trauma as profound as this would surely push any man to take arms against creation itself. Not a Asterion, however, the Minotaur disgraced creature is left with one outlet. 
もう。Did you just moo? Asterion looks up, his face awash with shame and cringe. He slums in utter defeat, an errant hand knocking a nearby apple off the table. By the gods, what a wretched day. The Minotaur looks away from you. I'm sorry. I think I misheard you. I could swear you, uh, said moo. Y yes, I sometimes do it when I, if there is too much, when it gets too much. It's like being in the middle of a storm. I get lost and I can't always hold it and then it happens. I, I let out a moo. That's adorable. I excuse me, but what did you just say? It's adorable! I didn't know you did that! A dropped cup of coffee's contents crawl their way to the table's edge. A droplet is pushed out to, then it becomes a stream as it, ca as, it ca as it cascades down to the floor just beside your foot. Before the cup can roll off as well, you push it back up with just a finger as to not bring Asterion's attention to it. Why is it adorable? It just is! You may not agree, but it is adorable. The Minotaur groans and you take the opportunity to lay your foot over the pesky apple as it attempts to roll away. You pull it back to yourself and press it against the side of your chair. A few drops run down the side of the orange juice cup, a puddle the size of a fingerprint is at its base. Somehow, I find that hard to believe. Come on, it's a compliment! Why would anyone compliment me? What is there to say? I can't even hold a fork like a person. Don't be like that. You are you are great. Just last night we had so much fun. I very much enjoyed your company. And you dealt so well with Greta's questions. You have a way with tough situations. That can't be. Mas the master must be teasing me. Fat chance. I'm being honest here. Your words, however, don't seem to have much of an effect. You might need to do something a little bit better to cheer him up. I'm gonna make a sandwich and eat with my hands. You look back to the battlefield on top of the table. Puddles of orange juice, a slice of cheese draped over a cup of coffee, jam over the cured meats, grease stains strewn all around a stein. side. It is, however, no messier than what you'd see on a rowdy night out in a bar with friends. And the food, for the most part, should still be safe to eat. With four slices of bread and what remains of the cheese and cured meats with the jam scraped off, you make two basic sandwiches. You do make sure to pack them as much as possible before the thing falls off before the thing falls off from the side. If this will be all you eat, you might as well make it plentiful. What do you say we leave this whole mess behind us and enjoy this for our breakfast? No need for cutlery here. The Minotaur clenches his jaws as he accepts your offer. He turns a bit to the side, avoiding your gaze, and you follow suit. The living room fills with the sound of your chewing, interrupted once or twice when Asterion reaches out for his cup of juice. The sandwich, of all things, breaks the air of tension in the room. What is left of the jam on the meat adds an unexpected twist to its salty taste, balanced by the cheese's neutral flavor. As you take another bite, you give the Minotaur a sideways glance. Ah! I gotta stop doing that! <laughs> and find him looking back to you, then averting his gaze. You look to the window, to the horizon of orange and blue, then back to Asteria, and this time he's the one who catches your gaze, but neither of you look away. You hunch over, elbows supported on your knees. Just then, you hear the swish of the Minotaur's tail against the ground. Thank you, and the sandwich is good. You are welcome. You know, I could make us more sandwiches now and then. Asterion opens his mouth to say something, but changes his mind. Instead, he grunts and looks away to finish his meal. Once it's done, he relaxes a bit, resting his hand between his legs, and almost staining his pants with the mess of jam, orange juice, and cheese oil on them. You want help with that? Asterion jerks his tail, twitches his ears, and lets out a rumble from his chest. His legs shift, hoofs scrape against the floor, but he nods. He extends his left hand to lay it over yours. The fur on his back on its back is short, but on his knuckles and the sides opposite to his thumb, there are scruffy patches, thicker, about a centimeter long. It is smooth and firm fur, as one might expect from his bovine heritage. And just below that thin layer, there is his hand, wholly human in shape. The nails, however, are black and thicker than any you've ever seen. You take a napkin with your left hand and you clean between his fingers, his, and as you clean between his fingers, his forearm tenses and sends contractions all the way to the palm of his hand and tip of his fingers. Like a cat's paw contracting over his owner's fingers, all of Asterion's fingers twitch and curl at once, trapping your hand in his grasp. His palm is sweaty and the beating of his heart makes itself known despite his coarse, thick skin. 
Just as you look up to him, you feel the fur at his wrist standing on end, followed by a rumble crawling from his chest all the way to your hand. Uh, I'm sorry. He lets your hand go with the same deliberate glacial pace he trapped it in the first place. Just as he lets you go, his fingers follow yours before stopping. You can swear his breathing quickened, but there's no doubt as he scoots his chair closer to you. When you reach in further to clean the fine webbing of his fingers, you feel a certain resistance. Asterian ga Asterian's gaze drills into his own hand. He tries to pry his fingers further apart to grant you better access, but it's, just, it's as if his nerves are made of stone. His fingers shudder and tremble. The Minotaur sighs and grunt ah, grunts each time he tries to mold his hand to ease your work. At last, you clean the palm of his hand, and just as your napkin grazes the center where the lines meet, all his fingers curl up again. His movements are twitchy, more like an involuntary and uncoordinated reflex than a willful act. I can't control it when you touch it like that. It just closes on reflex. I see. I sure am learning a lot about your hands today. I suppose you are. He opens his hand once more, and then you hover a finger over the palm, threatening to touch it. Asterian's gaze shows no opposition to what you are about to do. You graze the tip of your finger, slow enough to let your nail caress the hills and valleys of his handprint. The Minotaur's hands clutch as yours, but this time your deliberateness gifted Asterian with some of his own. His fingers rest between your knuckles, with his pinky hanging off to the side. He mutters something under his breath. When you look up to his face, you find his gaze lost, his chest bouncing up and down in shallow breaths. You budge a bit, but he doesn't want to let go. And in fact, there is just a tiny bit of pressure, as if he wanted to nudge your fingers apart to entwine them with his. Something like a mew escapes his throat, although he seems none the wiser about it. And you doubted me when I said you were adorable. Um... He's in a whole different world. Oh, this is so cute! Oh, this is adorable! This is exactly what I wanted! Oh, it's so sweet! The sensation is not at all unpleasant if one doesn't mind his sweaty palm. In fact, having such a larger hand holding yours feel like being a ch feels like being a child once more. Again, you try to open your hand, and this time he complies, but you don't disengage. With such a useful spirit, with such a youthful spirit taking over your mind, an idea springs forth. Before your hands separate, you pull him back to entwine your fingers once more, with your thumbs pointing up this time. Oh dear, have you ever played thumb wrestling? Is that a thing people used to do? Huh? The thumb wrestling? Yeah, it's a game kids play nowadays. By nowadays, I mean that I played when I was in school. It's not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. We hold hands like this, and you demonstrate by trying to pin his thumb down, although it is an unfair match from the get-go. His hand is like a Goliath to your David. Then we try to pin each other's thumbs, just like wrestling. I see. Except he doesn't. The first round the two of you play is defined by his passivity and a lack of quick reflexes. During the second one, he fares better. He puts up more of a fight, but when it comes down to a contest of, contest of strength, he lets you win without much opposition. He is getting focused on the task, however. His breathing returns to regularity, and his eyes regain some sharpness. Are you going easy on me? Come on, put up some resistance. Um, okay, how about this? This time, Goliath crushes the competition. Aetherian's thumb crashes on top of yours and overpowers you. There, like that? Yeah, now how about best out of three? His hand may be bigger than yours and covered in fur, and his nails may be dark like coal, but while indulging in such childish playtime, it's easy to let the world melt away around you. What games did Asterian play when he was a kid? Thumb wrestling may not have been one of them, but it awakens something in him nonetheless. He laughs, giggles, flicks his ears, and thrashes his tail around. It is hard to say for sure, but even his cheeks seem a little flushed now. These intervals, of, these intervals of childish wonder cannot last long, however. The living room is still a mess. After your playtime, Asterian won. The two of you tidy up the place, carrying still the soreness in your cheeks that comes when one laughs too much. At times, he offers you an unashamed glance, with no attempt of hiding it. Oh, we're finally getting somewhere with my boy. Would Master believe me if I said you remind me of an old friend? Really? What was he like? Perhaps that is a matter for another time. We do have our duties to attend to, do we not? And I have a mess to clean up as well. You take a good look at the floor. 
I am afraid you are right. In fact, we have a special mission for today, one of exceptional importance. Is that so? Now, what does my wise lord have in mind? Well, do you remember our conversation last night about the internet? That's what we need to do. Connect this lonesome place to the outside world. Nowadays, all guests expect to have an internet connection whenever they stop by a hotel. We need to keep up with modern times. Ah, uh, yes, I remember now. You wish, then, for me to take you to that place I told you about? Very well. Is the master ready? May we proceed? Yes. Let's go. In the next episode, I know we didn't necessarily go a lot of places in this one, and I'm a little bit limited on my recording time today, but I wanted to at least get something out there, and this was just so sweet and so wholesome, and how could you not love it? Look at him! He's precious! Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video- Washing? Washing. If you liked it, leave a like. If you don't, that's okay. I understand completely. I'm kind of a weird person to begin with anyways. Just, you know, enjoy the fluffy minotaur boy, and I'll see you in the next episode, okay? Okay, goodbye!